Welcome in everyone and thanks so much for joining me. Today I'm going to discuss a question from you. Uh, one of my listeners, one of my watchers asked if I can uh, share some ideas, theories, philosophies from Buddhism on what is mind. Uh, how does Buddhism talk about mind? Uh, what's the reason why we see so many teachings, philosophies, and discussions on mind in Buddhism? So thanks so much for the question. And just before I um, go into the content on that, for some of you out there who have questions about meditation or the Buddhist path or just anything you think you'd like to hear um, more from me on, go ahead and reach out to me at scotttusa.com. Um, I'll try to do some content on it if I can. So yeah, feel free to reach out. So mind in Buddhism is a big subject. Um, when you really look at the Buddhist canon, most of it revolves around this question of what is mind? how to use our mind skillfully to reduce and eliminate suffering um, and increase uh, states and ways of being around awakening, uh, freedom and enlightenment. And so it's a pretty um, <laughs> big question actually. And um, as I usually do, I'll, I'll be able to talk a little bit about uh, some perspectives on, on this topic. Um, it will not be exhaustive, but I will try my best to share some ideas that I find helpful and useful on um, this topic of, of a Buddhist perspective on mind. So the first thing um, I was reflecting on is this question of, of why um, Buddhism has so much um, content, uh, categorization, and discussion on mind. And one of the key themes you can see again and again in the Dharma is this discussion that mind is primary. And what that means is that all um, other actions follow from mind. So the theory here is that um, any actions of our physical body as well as our speech first start as an idea, um, a thought, a memory, maybe you can even say like a habitual pattern that's stored in this thing called mind. And there's many words for mind in Buddhism, uh, especially in the, the Tibetan Buddhist canons. You have um, words like sem um, that refer to a kind of uh, dualistic mind. But then you can also find different categorizations of mind based on the context or what practice uh, we're talking about or what aspect of mind we're talking about. So I'm, I'm going to just talk in general about mind. And um, yeah, starting with this idea that mind is primary and, and all actions of uh, body and speech follow from mind. This initial idea that's put forth is meant uh, as a reflection. It's also meant to empower us uh, as when we recognize that we have agency um, in working with our mind, it then follows that we have agency in what we do with our body and speech. So this is one of the reasons um, it's primary in Buddhism and that uh, we talk about mind as this kind of, um, yeah, state that all other actions follow from. So I just want to share a reflection that you can take away from this content initially, um, which is, you know, just reflecting on your own life, um, depending on what states of mind that are coming up for you within the day, what thoughts are arising, what emotions are arising. How does that affect your body? How does that affect um, how you speak to yourself internally or how you speak to others uh, externally? So we can experiment with this a little bit and just see how useful it is to understand the mind. Because if we understand the mind, we gain more uh, agency with or over it. We're able to affect um, the rest of our actions throughout the day, including our moods, including our inner states, including how we interact and connect with um, others around us. We're, we're able to affect that in, in a in a healthier way. We're able to affect that in a way that can bring more well-being, ease, and happiness. So that's just a reflection for you. You know, is that true? Um, experiment with yourself. See how that is, because a lot of the time. Um, we're confused by the mind, we're confused by our thoughts, we're confused by our emotions, memories, etc. And a lot of this has to do with over-identifying around things. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But just as an initial reflection, uh, see if you can take that into an open question to reflect on a little bit on, on how this shows up in your life, how your mind colors uh, your day, how your mind colors your week or month or, or moment in time. 
So in this episode, I'm mostly going to talk about um, the relative aspects of mind and how we can use those in meditation and how we can start to relate to those in a, in a healthier way um, in our life in general. Um, but mind does get categorized in Buddhism into these two aspects of its absolute nature, its ultimate nature, and then its relative nature. So Buddhist philosophy is full of different kinds of ways of categorizing uh, the relative nature of mind. And we learn to understand and see um, the destructive qualities of mind, what we normally call klesha or afflictive emotion. And we also learn um, and understand and, and through meditation um, learn to see um, the beneficial qualities of mind when we can develop loving kindness, compassion, patience, um, these beneficial qualities of mind that we actually encourage within the Buddhist path and within our meditation practice. So in general, there can be, um, you know, classifications of this with, with you know, many numbers, etc. So I, again, I'm not going to go too much into that today. This is more meant for meditators to start to develop a relationship with the basic qualities of mind and then how to cultivate um, beneficial qualities of, of awareness in meditation. So one simple classification to understand our mind a little bit more is to see it in its aspects of thinking, which uh, most of us are in the majority of the day, right? Which also causes us, um, you know, quite a few problems. And uh, we also need it, right? A lot of our activities revolve around thinking critically, um, around using our thinking mind in a beneficial way. So thinking itself is not good or bad. Uh, but when we are caught in thinking and unable to use it skillfully, but instead we're con controlled by it, uh, this, this can become a problem, obviously. So the other aspects of mind I'm going to name are helpful in that we can start to cultivate ways of working with our mind in meditation that's not just thinking. So the next quality is knowing. And knowing is more of a raw experience. Uh, so you can imagine a flower, for instance, uh, or a cup. And you don't have to think, when you initially see that with your eyes, you don't have to think, oh, that's a cup or that's a flower. We just know it. So this is more of a raw quality of the mind that just knows. It's a natural quality where once we have the habit pattern uh, to know a certain object or thing or phenomena, the mind just knows it. We don't have to think to know. So then after knowing, we have this quality of mind we call awareness. And awareness is the main subject of Buddhist meditation. It's what we cultivate. It's what we... Um, train or learn to see more as an aspect of mind, and then we strengthen it in meditation. And so awareness is something just like knowing and thinking. It's something we're born with. Um, every sentient being has an ability to be aware, but normally we don't train it. Normally we are caught in our thinking mind, we're knowing objects, but we're not necessarily aware that we're knowing. So awareness here has a quality of of double knowing, that we can be aware that we're knowing something. We can be aware that we're thinking something. Another word I like to use to describe awareness is a sense of watchfulness, right? So not watching. Watching um, is something a little bit, I think, disconnected, where watchfulness is connected. It's like we're, we're knowing, we're in the experience, but we're also watchful of it at the same time. And this watchfulness or this sense of awareness of what we're knowing or thinking or experiencing is this natural quality of mind we try to recognize in meditation. We try to cultivate it or sustain it. And then over time, we can strengthen it and learn to abide more in this quality of awareness. So that's this third quality of mind. Now, where does everything come out of? And this, this really gets more to this question of what is mind. Um, and from a Buddhist perspective, we could say everything comes out of this sense of clear knowing or clarity, right? So clarity here doesn't mean the clarity of awareness or the clarity of knowing or the clarity of thinking. It actually refers to a quality of clarity, that the mind itself is clear, that the mind itself, just like a light in the room, uh, once it's turned on, everything in the room becomes illuminated, Right. So if a light's turned off and it's really dark, but there's a dresser, a bed, you know, uh, paintings on the wall, other kinds of objects in the room, when the light's off, we're not going to even know there's objects in the room. Right. Unless we touch them. But just through our eyes, we're not going to be able to see it. So similarly, the mind is like a light that's actually on 24 seven. Right. Whether we're awake, whether we're sleeping, etc. 
And this light illuminates all other experience. It's actually this light of mind, this, this clear or clarity aspect of mind that knowing, awareness, and thinking come from, as well as all other states of mind. So clarity itself is not necessarily a um, beneficial or destructive thing. It's, it's just there right so just as water can take on different colors if we pour you know pur purple uh, food coloring into water or blue food coloring the water will take on the characteristics of the color um, so does this clarity aspect of mind so why is this important this is important because when we're developing a meditative awareness practice we learn to train in awareness and then over time the thinking mind is able to settle and we're able to access or know or be aware of this clarity aspect of mind and simply rest awareness there so this is incredibly important because it's a more subtle aspect of mind it's where everything arises from in in the relative mind right and when we start to familiarize with it or get to know it, um, we have another place to abide, right? Because as I said earlier, most of us are just caught in the thinking mind. And that's, you know, our, our safe place as well as a, kind of a like, a, like a torturous place sometimes, right? If we're honest. And so in meditation, we learn to abide aware of clarity and to rest there. And it's not only just really helpful for everyday living and interaction, but from a Buddhist perspective, from there we can also develop uh, beneficial qualities of mind. As I said earlier, compassion, loving kindness, uh, patience, um, qualities of trust that are that are trusting in things that are going to bring more awakening and and benefit for ourselves and others. So, this is one of the benefits of understanding mind. This is um, just uh, just a little bit on how we might categorize mind for a meditator. And then, of course, um, if you want to go deeper, we go into categorizing mind in its destructive and beneficial states. That's also really useful. So there's some texts that go into that. Again, like I said, I'm not going to go into that in, in this particular episode. But if you want, that, that is really useful to explore. But generally, once we have a sense of awareness and clarity, it allows us not only to abide in the present moment um, with less um, obstruction of projection from the thinking mind, right, and, and, and judgment, etc. Uh, but also, like I said, we can then cultivate beneficial qualities easier because we don't have that judgment and, and block arising, um, you know, as, as sort of we are heavily identifying with our thoughts. So that brings me to, I think, one of the main benefits of training in awareness and, and accessing and abiding in this uh, clarity aspect of the mind is that most of us, um, you know, identify strongly with our thoughts and emotions. And when we meditate, we start to see, you know, emotions arise, thoughts arise, and yet um, they're not fundamentally who we are, right? So part of the issue is we take our thoughts and emotions to be fundamental aspects of our being. And in fact, they're just arising, right? And so a little bit of taste of uh, how we might work with the mind in an absolute nature. So when we work with the absolute nature of mind, we're trying to see that mind actually doesn't abide anywhere. And then based on that, thoughts, emotions, perceptions also don't abide anywhere. Now, this doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means that we can have a deeper experience of the fluidity of thoughts, the fluidity of emotions, that there is no basis that they're arising from. There's no basis that they abide in, and there's no basis that they, they go to when they dissolve. And this brings genuine freedom from a Buddhist perspective. If we really take that to its um, ultimate a realization, we can attain uh, what's called awakening or Buddhahood. And so this is this is important because when we start to relate with the relative aspect of mind, we're developing more clarity, less projection, but then it's really relating to the absolute nature of mind. That mind is ultimately unfindable, yet it appears uh, that brings genuine true freedom. So just a little bit on that. Uh, we can find more on that uh, in the emptiness teachings coming from the Prajnaparamita Sutras, as well as in the Mahamudra traditions, Dzogchen traditions, and the Tantric traditions, as well as just general what we call middle way or Madhyamaka teachings. So these are really important 
Because when we start to work with the nature of mind, its absolute nature, um, this provides freedom because when we realize uh, first that everything comes from mind, but we also realize that mind is not a singular, independent, permanent thing, there's so much fluidity that can arise. And of course, for most of us, this isn't just a singular event of fluidity. It's something we're developing, right? So it starts with a lot of confusion and just feels like, you know, mind is me, right? Mind is self, thoughts are self, thoughts are me, etc. And then the more we work with these kinds of practices, the more we work with the mind uh, in this way, we start to have some fluidity, some flexibility, and then we can grow that, right? So I think I'll, I'll, I'll end here. Um, but that's just some ideas on, on what is mind from a Buddhist perspective, um, why it's important uh, to think about it, reflect on it, study it, uh, eventually meditate and, and, and see mind both in its relative aspects and its absolute aspects. And um, yeah, I think this is also um, important in, in, the, in this question. Part of, part of the question that, that this person asked was, um, you know, is mind uh, material or not? Uh, so I'll just say a little bit about that. So from a Buddhist perspective, um, no, mind is not material itself, but of course it depends on our physiology. So in this sense, the brain and um, everything associated with, with helping to activate our human experience through the mind, of course, uh, mind is dependent upon the body when we're in this human body. But mind itself um, it is not material from a Buddhist perspective. And we can see this. I'll give you an exercise uh, just, to, just to close here. Imagine um, a blue ball, just in your imagination, you know, whatever size, whatever shape, imagine it. Now, of course, this blue ball, part of, you know, the color, its shape, uh, the image in our mind, the brain is, is um, helping to produce that image. But I'm gonna ask a question here. Is the image itself the brain? Meaning like what you're imagining right now in your mind's eye, is that itself the brain? We know it. the brain is helping to produce it. So, so there's physiology that's helping to produce that image, but the image itself is not material. So just a little thing to play with on your own. Um, that can take some time. So even if it didn't click right now, just work with that. And again, all, all of these things I'm, I'm sharing here are open questions. They're not dogmas, right? Uh, these are things to reflect on. Um, sometimes this requires quite a bit of study in, in, in you know, traditional Buddhism. And then, of course, things will deepen. But most of all, it's important how we know how to apply these in our reflection and meditation so we can start to taste freedom. So thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciate you joining. And again, just to invite you, please uh, uh, send out questions, topics, things you'd like to know more about. You can reach me at scotttusa.com. Thanks so much.